I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. I am back in studio today after flying across the fruited plains yesterday from North Carolina. Zach, it seems like it was just yesterday I was with you. It does seem like that for some reason. <laughs> Here I am. Um, we were talking. You did, re- you, you did return my cast iron skillet, which I'm thankful for. I, I told was, you. I said uh, when I was walking out that door, I said the one thing you can trust about Al is if I borrow something, it is coming back. Because the one thing that drives me insane, I, I'm not very possessive of my stuff. My kids know. My neighbors know. You can borrow anything you want with one condition. Hmm. Bring it back. Well, that's why you quit duck hunting. That's it. Because I've noticed that all my stuff, people keep borrowing it. Yeah. And they don't bring it back. They don't back. bring it back. It drives me crazy. I mean, like, my, I, I, I mean, I look up, though. It's just is odd. I look up, um, and it's probably, I felt like it was like 1030 at night. When would you come? No, it was before dinner because we were going to cook dinner. It felt and like 1030 at night because you've had 25 people in your house for six days, Zach. That's, that makes That's every it. time feel like 1030. But Al's got like three cast iron skillets, and he's walking out with them. There's no like, hey, how you doing? Just <laughs> comes in, grabs the skillets, and he's walking out. It's true family. So, and so so family. Zach's like, did you get my smithy? And I said, well, I don't know what that is, but I got two skillets, and I will bring them back when I'm What I'm is done. a smithy? Apparently, oh, the skillet was real. I, I, honestly, I feel like they should pay for what I'm about to say. <laughs> but I, it, I mean... <laughs> If so you ever want, Zach's ever the ad man. If you want the best cast iron skillet that it you is. that you cool. can get your hands on, I mean, you used it, Al. Was I it used not, it. I mean, it's fantastic. Look, it you, heats up good. So we wait made, a minute now. You either have cast iron or you don't. Yeah, but nah, this, this one, is this is. I'm telling you. So I think what what I was told, Zach, and you can you know more about the product because it's the first time I you. Although I now have the website, so I'm fixing to buy me one. But if they make them, there are, yeah, it takes cast iron a while to get like smooth. At first, it's kind of rough, and you have to, the more it's you It's like cook grainy, it, the texture grainy, on it's rough. Right. But this one comes to you smooth. And I mean, it, it really heated in a, it quicker and better than. I mean, than I could fry an egg in this thing, and I could put an egg in there with just a little bit of, you know, it, do, it doesn't stick. I mean, this thing is like glass. I mean, it's a cast iron with the bottom. That, is as smooth and slick as glass from the, the, the when you get out of the box, it's that way. Yeah, I mean it's, it's very impressive. impressive. And it, what I liked about it, Zach, was the size. Like, because you know you got like a Dutch oven, you got the small cast iron, you got the big cast iron. Jace has one half as big as his table. I actually won that in a card game. Did you really? I did. A local card game. A local card. You know some of these. Well, boys, what do you what do you cook in it? His sweet fries is shrimp and stuff okay. in, right? Yeah. I mean, it's big. He, uh, his dad's got one like that. Well, it was a it's guy. Like a small wash tub. Yeah. A guy, you know, he lost. I mean, we're not, think small stakes here, but he was like, well, I left my wallet in my truck, you know, after everybody's, you know, where's the, I'm good for <laughs> was it. Was it Zach? Thing. No, it wasn't Zach. He's bad about leaving his wallet in his <laughs> but, truck. Uh, <laughs> intentionally. <laughs> so I followed him out there because I happened to be the big winner that night. And he said, "Now I got a bunch of stuff. He set, he sold stuff, yeah, and like pawn shop kind of deal, yeah." And I was like, "Well, let me let me take a look at what you got here." <laughs> you know? Now you, this yeah. is a true redneck poker game. Yeah. When at the end of the night you're out perusing the product in the back of the yeah. Truck. Now Rounding, I did say if, you for something you get a buck of something of yeah. value. At that moment I said, "Now this this is not stolen merchandise or anything." Yeah, you got to make sure it didn't it didn't come from the. Oh pawn no, shop. it's not. It's all good. And that the first thing I saw with all this junk in the back of that truck was the biggest black cast iron skillet I've ever seen. And I was like, well, what you want for that? I think he said 60 bucks. I was like, okay, take that off my bill. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like a drill set, you know, still, I mean, unopened, like still in the package. I was like, Jace was like that. that? Jace is like the guy at these uh, arcades when you go up and they, 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 Take those tickets they yeah. won from all the games, and they're taking off the little candies and whatnot. How much do I have left? <laughs> well, Sounds yeah. like an episode of Pickers. You're losing. Like a Pickers. But I was you're paying losing. retail. If you're, so. I've never played a game of cards, but <laughs> it seems to me like if you're losing, you would have a car, a vehicle loaded with 
stuff that can you can trade. Yeah, that's so, what uh, this was. The first level is, the, where's the green? Well, the green ain't here. Yeah, we don't have any well, green. Well, let's go out in the back of my truck, and we'll go out there and look and see if there's anything worth what I just lost. Well, yeah. it was a pretty good deal because he's actually selling the stuff at retail. Yeah. He paid way less yeah. for that. And, but I didn't care because I yeah. thought, well, let me just go shop. That gentleman needs to get out of that particular <laughs> trade. Well, you know what's funny? <laughs> I've never seen him again. <laughs> hey, you yeah. took his cast iron skillet, man. Yeah, I think I he mean, had that's... a moment. <laughs> he he had a moment started when, that gets, <laughs> when you're losing your pots and pans, you need to give that's up it. the game, dude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you can't I mean, that's, cook that, he, did, he, he <laughs> literally didn't have a pot to pee in. And you took it from him, Jace. <laughs> right. Oh, he, he reminded me of, uh, which is funny. Is remember the elixir salesman in the outlaw Josie Wales? Mm -hmm. Cause he was like, yeah. he pulled up some bottle, you know, Mr. Carpetbagger. He, oh yeah, he had a bunch of those. I was like, no. I said, well, how's that on stains? <laughs> what that he Indian tell him? Looked at me. You need to, you know, what? How do you? How does it? How do you drink it? You drink it. <laughs> yeah, because Mary said that the Indian said you drink it. He meant, and I'll watch you and <laughs> yeah. see if it works. He thought, oh, 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 oh. Lone yeah. Whitey. That's my take on potlucks, which I've I've tried to distance myself the older I get. So but I'll just get what my wife brings. Yeah. Then I'll watch everybody else's response. Well, we were always a couple. We were trained that way. Yeah. There's always a couple things that people light up about, and then I'll go over and get that. Right. But when they yeah. make that old face, and like, I'm like, ooh, don't get don't that. Don't do that. Yeah. So I borrowed the two uh, skillets from Zach. Because we were eating over at Melissa's for New Year's Day. And uh, I think I mentioned it when, we, when I was up there. We did the traditional. It was just black-eyed peas and cabbage and pork roast. It was delicious. But Lisa used the Smithy, uh, which I didn't realize what a good product it was, till we used it to cook a big, huge thing of Mexican cornbread, um, which is kind of her one of her specialties. So we well, had that with it. Your wife came up today in the duck blind. And we all realize duck hunting today because we don't have a lot of ducks, but we realize. So you're going to have a lot more conversation when you don't have as many Yeah, ducks. we're not what we once were. <laughs> that was the theme of the hunt today. <laughs> we should have killed six mallards and we killed three. So, and a couple wood ducks. But we got enough for, you know, mass to eat. Yeah, a little gumbo. But oh, uh, Jersey Joe, who said, I guess I brought him up in a previous podcast because he said, boy, I heard you were. Oh, and haymakers at me on the podcast, which I don't even remember that. But I said, well, it's not personal. Because I told him, I was like, look, if you want a duck hunt, you've got to, there's three things you need to do. You need to have real thick skin. Yep. You need to do more listening than talking. And number three is whatever job you figure out how you can contribute here, do your job. So I thought that was pretty good advice. Pretty good. But anyway, he, you know, he brought up the fact that he evidently, I, I threw some haymakers at him and, yeah. and over. It was about him moving in the blind or something. I remember vaguely. Yeah. So. And it wasn't personal. No. Y'all know me. He was just I the mean, new guy and he was moving around. You just, I mean, like today, my own dad, look, these, the first two ducks came in and they got right over the decoys. They lifted up. Well, I looked down the blind. Well, everybody had face paint on, but Phil, which... I, I'm sure he just forgot to put it on, but I didn't say anything because, you know, he is my dad. Right. I just took some face paint and threw it down there. <laughs> and he put it, he put it, he put it on. Which is, so, was, was a very nice passive aggressive yeah, way. Phil, did saying. you get your feelings hurt because we passed no. the face paint down? No, it, it's not personal. Right. But today, evidently, I, I don't know anything about this, but he said, yeah, I, I'm learning. I can't do his accent, I, I, you know, the Jersey. Yeah, he's got, a, he's got a pretty good accent. Yeah, which he keeps saying, we talk funny. And I thought, well, I thought you talk funny. He calls water wooder. Yeah. Wooder. Well, maybe wooder. that's why I'm not understanding half what yeah, he's saying. Right. So uh, he brought up this chili. He, he, he made some chili. Oh. And uh, Jay said, terrible. And he, he hasn't gotten over it. He said it hurt, because he, he made the statement, he said it hurt my feelings. And I said, well, why did it hurt your feelings? He's like, because they have been talking about that chili for two years. <laughs> and I said, well, Jay, what was wrong with the chili? I didn't even eat the chili. But Jay said it was like meat soup. It was watery. It was real watery. And he said it had no spice. And I said, well, see, that's 
that's what the problem is here. You, you've got to quit, quit saying, oh, why y'all keep getting on to me about the chili? And go make some, cook it longer, and put more cayenne pepper. <laughs> that's the pepper. difference. He won't make it like we have so scarred him from it. He won't even try it again. But here's what happened. Now, y'all, y'all appreciate this because y'all know how Robertsons are. So we invite Joe and Christine over to eat. And they were like, great, can we bring something? I said, well, no, not really, because Lisa's making chili. Well, then the next thing Joe says is, oh, well, I'll make, I'll bring some of my chili, too. See, what he's got to realize. That was the first serious mistake, because well, now you're going to. that's the gonna... danger. You've entered the danger. This is you getting up and shooting ducks without anybody else shooting. That's and we've seen that happen this year. Yep. It didn't go well for him. <laughs> Because we're all watching. That's right. So you don't want to, in the cooking, it's the same equation. Well, we know, like, you would wait and see what you were up against. But he, now by offering to, and I never said don't bring it. Well, because that's a form of competition. It is, because you're, now you're going to set it right next to Lisa's, who makes really I good I would stuff. have thought he was so confident that well, he's I did. saying, I thought, hey, hold your spoon and watch this. And look, he is an excellent cook. So, so he comes in, he's got a crock pot. Which I thought right off the bat, I thought bad sign for chili. Now, at least Lisa makes it in a cast iron skillet and it's really good. He sets it down and it was deer meat, it wasn't beef, which we love deer meat, but you know, we got to do a lot sometimes with deer meat. Sometimes yeah, it's because now we're getting into how old was this deer? Exactly. Who cleaned the deer? And then when he lifted the lid off, I looked in it and I saw it was water and I thought, Oh boy, Joe. <laughs> You stepped in it now. So look, we eat. Let's see, I, I wouldn't even have tried. I tried it. I mean, look, Missy makes one of the greatest chilies of all time. But when, uh, during the holidays, we had our whole family there, so she quadrupled the recipe. Yeah. Well, five o'clock came, six o'clock came, seven o'clock came, and she said, "Jace, come check this chili for me," which I thought was weird because she's never asked me to do that ever in the history of her making chili. She, it's awesome, her chili. So I thought, that's odd. So I go in there, and she's got my big skillet out because she quadrupled the recipe. I open the lid. I said, nope, it's not ready. When you quadrupled the recipe, it's going to take four times as long, I guess. She said, well, we can't wait any longer. (laughs) I said, well, you asked my opinion. (laughs) I'm saying it's not ready. And she said, well, I mean, why don't we just try it? I said, no, here's what we do. Y'all try it, and because you've taken out three fourths of it, yep. we'll then speed up the cooking process, and then I'll eat it when it's ready. And that's what happened. <laughs> so mine was great; theirs was just doable, doable. Because you got to slow cook it, and over time, that's what makes it great. But anyway, so the story ends. We didn't say much about it. I don't recall him asking about it. We just, I, I did try it. It, it wasn't much, it's, but it look, it wouldn't have been as bad if I'd have been at his house eating it. It wouldn't have been as bad as if it wasn't right next to really, really good chili. So, so he leaves there. He's he's brought his chili. Nobody said anything in the moment. And when he gets home, when Jay calls him because Jay came in late, he tries some of the chili. He's like, "This is the worst thing I ever tried to eat." So then he calls Joe and tells him. He said, "This chili he brought was terrible. The worst I've ever. It's horrible. Never bring this to the house again." So Joe is like, "Well, and Lisa didn't say anything." He said, "They were being nice." <laughs> yeah, that was what. That's where I was getting to, because because he said, well, Jay said it was terrible, but Lisa came in and said, oh, that it's fine. Disregard him. And I said, you don't know what that means. <laughs> he said, what does it mean? I said, that means it's terrible. It's terrible. But we love you anyway. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. When you say it's fine, I said, Lisa's never going to say a negative word about anybody. That's right. He said, are you kidding me? I said, no, that was code for that was terrible. <laughs> You're right. That's exactly what happened. So we got that solved today. So let's Well, uh, Phil, star- Phil started all that because I remember early on in my life, he said that if you ever, if somebody cooks bad food and you tell them it's good, particularly your, your wife, the, they'll keep doing it. And yeah, so there was exactly. always this. He also he said, on bad cooking. Yeah. He also said, if you don't work and you say, well, live off love, you'll starve to death. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He did say that too. That was another good thing. Let's take a break. It's skinny. Now I had a thought. Okay. We must define what a Samaritan is. That's a good point. So, off the top of your head, 
Why would you name it Samaritan Ministries? Well, it has to be after the Good Samaritan, which uh, is in what, Luke 10, I think, maybe? Pretty good. I'm Plus, guessing. if you read the whole book, <laughs> you'll find it in there. You'll find it. There was a Samaritan that helped out some people, uh, even though he wasn't as obligated as the two guys that went before him should have been that didn't help the guy. Well, there you go. There you go. That's pretty good, Dad. And and that's the name of our ministry uh, that's uh, supporting our podcast. It's called Samaritan Ministries. And basically what they do is they're part of a Christian community, and you are as well when you're a part of what they're doing. But when there's a medical need that comes up, some unexpected thing that happens, they're going to help you pay those medical bills. You're helping other people do that. So that's where your money is going when you need help. They send it to you. There's no networks, so you're in charge of your family's health care. Uh, you get to choose your own doctors, hospitals, whatever treatment you need. Uh, you can join up today, or you can start in your membership application, and when you join, you can start then. So it can start any time. Uh, it's a biblical solution to health care where you bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. And as Jace has said, it's really like that Samaritan that Jesus yeah. told a story about. So somebody says, you Samaritan... Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And in the de- the time he wrote it, it wasn't so good, but it became a good thing because it was a person that helped other people. Uh, also, just, oh, by the way, because Lisa and I are doing this now, it's much more affordable uh, than the other way. So wh- whatever the need is, whether it's broken bone, uh, some unexpected diagnosis, an emergency medical bill that comes in, you get to connect to 80,000 Christian households across the nation who are ready there to help you not only financially, but also spiritually. One thing I love about it is we call in, ask a question, they always pray with us. So there is a real foundation for Christianity here. Become part of this community today uh, by going to SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. So I've got some. I've got a reveal here. Oh, uh, I was ready to get into Luke twenty. Oh, no, we're fixing to, but right. I, I wanted so something came. You made me nervous when you start bringing out this. Bringing you out feel like it's, you feel like it's going to be a gimmick or something. Well, it's uh, know, it's. I'm not it's, much of a surprise guy. So this came to our okay. crack staff of one, Maddie. And she brought it with her today. Oh, okay. okay. We got so this there. is the coveted. Oh, we actually got oh, yeah. the actual got the award. Well, there now, now I I have breaking news. I think now you can say award winning because we actually have the award. You actually, have, see, I've felt uncomfortable about this for the last year. Now it took a year. It took it's almost begins, time to vote again. One begins to wonder if it takes a year to get the. <laughs> I think it's Trophy. been more like three or four months. But. It's been a few months. It's a few months to figure out, did they really win it? Well, here's one thing I observed, because y'all probably didn't notice it, because they handed the award to me when we were on the stage. What we yeah. got on stage was just a prop. Because one thing is, it was four times heavier than this thing, and it wasn't well, near the, as nice this as this. thing's heavy. But, and the other one was four times heavier, Joe. Yeah. But this looks much nicer, so I think they like came up with a much nicer trophy than the one they just hand you. At That's the table. Nice. Well, I mean, our our listeners deserve this, which award. is why I wanted to present it because yeah. they sent it to us. But unashamed nation, this is your award because one is if you hadn't have voted for the podcast, it never would have won. If you if you didn't listen to the podcast, it wouldn't have won. And That's we right. went up against some really other good co- podcasts as well. So we did. It's your it's a award. Gold, it's a gold K. If you're listening on the on the uh, audio feed, it's a gold K. It's, it's a gold K. What, is it, what does it say on there? I can't read it. It says a K Love Fan Awards 2023 Podcast Impact Award, unashamed with Phil and Jace Robertson. K Love Fan and Awards. Al. Well, they need to put Al's name on there. Well, and. And well, almost, well, uh, they should put and Al and almost almost Zach. Zach. <laughs> you got Zach fifty percent of the time. Well, and look by the way, because I have been asked this many times, I've said it before. I want to say it again since we just brought it up. The reason the podcast is named Phil and Jace is because Zach and I, at the beginning, were producers of the podcast. We still are. But in the early days, we had a production company that we don't have anymore, but we produced it. So 
we it wasn't our podcast. We appeared on this podcast, and although I've been on all of them. No, y'all just thought the only way this is going to work is for it to produce is if we actually contribute. That's right. Exactly. I mean, I knew early we, on, because early on they said, yeah. we're going to have, the, the very first ones we did was just going to be Phil, just solo, just mano a mano. And I said, I, you know, that's going to be good for a few episodes, but that's just going to be preaching. Well, look at it from my perspective. I'm a guest that never left. Yeah, you're the one, because you weren't I mean, even a part of the original discussion. This is no, like 10 o'clock at night, you know, somebody's at my house, they're guests. I'm like, well, I'm going to bed. Y'all can hang out. <laughs> And then they you just know, stay. And they just stay. That was me. I'm that guy. So Who that's why got? it says with Phil and Jay's, by the way, for those of you feeling, you know, like wondering if we're wounded, we're not. We've been producing the podcast. Because you have thick skin, which is the And we have thick skin. Thing. That's the point we've been trying to make. You got to have thick skin. Whether you're from New Jersey or Louisiana or, as ZZ Top said, all points in between. <laughs> that's right. What were you going to say, is that? I was going to say, we're going to probably do a little rebranding this coming up year shortly. So we'll See, now that kind of stuff tuned. makes me nervous. I don't know what well, that means. When I think rebranding, I, I like think... I like just drop that in. I'm market. looking at a guy from Texas with a hot iron trying to put something on somebody that, or some helpless cow that doesn't really want that. We're gonna they're gonna have a little upgrade, a little a little uh All makeover right. a little bit. You know, it'll be good. It'll be We're good. just gonna we'll put excited. the sign of Tin Bear on there, Jason. We'll be part of the oh, family. Yeah. So All right, so we're ready to get to loop. Well, well we're gonna find a prominent place for a future podcast on our big shelf back here, um, to uh, put our award. Since it's, we are now a um, award winning podcast. Jason's right, it's official because we have the trophy to prove it. So but it's not for, it's not us, it's you. Yeah, I mean, it's, your it's, it's a fan. Well, I've noticed uh, the human race observation is that they get bored rather rapidly, most people. You know bored. you know where you get that from? Because you spend a lot of time in a duck blind. You look around, I can tell these boys, they get bored if they're not shooting their weapon every five to ten minutes. Mm-hmm. Jay keeps just leaving. Yeah. He, he's there. You look up. He, yep. he's, he he can't. You know that's why you eat in the blind and cook. it's just boredom. Is that's a, why I used to chew tobacco um, in my youth. Is because I was bored deer hunting and duck hunting. I mean, because there's so much time in between something happening. Now it's a lot better now than it used to be because we have more deer and more ducks typically. But yeah, in the old days, I mean, when I first started deer hunting, Dad would take me out. Here's you know we're trying to kill deer to eat. But he set me on the side of a tree on an uncomfortable, you know, two two by fours, just wide as my rear end. And it was like, all right, look down this little lane and, you know, all morning. Well, I mean, there I didn't see a deer. This was back in the 70s. I didn't see a deer for five seasons. Yeah, you know what's crazy is when I was 10 years old, so I've been duck hunting two years. But, of course, not on my own. Yeah. Because, and I only went a few times. So, so Phil... Came to the Lord when I was eight, I think, you know, a little earlier, but he was hunting season happened when I was eight. And so he took us hunting for the first couple of times. And it's kind of featured in the movie. That was like his yeah. life change was starting to take us. So a couple of years later, he gets this, this break up in uh, Tensile Parish. And of course, he said, why don't you just stay out there with me, you know, for about a week, which I thought, man, boy, he's really wanting me to go hunting with him. No, he wanted me to clean up the camp and try to kill all these mice because remember it was a mouse infestation thousands that, yeah we we the actual truth is we left there because of the mice yep. i mean just is incredible but the trailer the hunting trailer was the only structure within miles so every mouse in tensile parish was <laughs> coming yeah. to that trailer so phil was the walls got, phil was a uh, solid mice oh, and the reason i say that is because when i got out there phil was guide. he had a guide trip you know and I, I was 10 years old i didn't know anything about this so i was getting all the stuff ready i was just an extra hand yeah you were and the they would go hunt yep and i'm sitting back out to the trailer i was like just terrified because i'm surrounded by mice so i started begging i was like well just take me and drop me off at another blind you know, but I'm 10 years old, so because I didn't realize what that meant. But Phil did one day, and 
They dropped me off. You remember this? Y'all oh, dropped yeah. me off. And this stand was Up a tall 30, tree. 30, 40 feet high, and it was below freezing. I mean, and you know, this is like throwing a kid in a swimming pool and saying, good luck. I mean, they dropped me off at the ladder. I got messed up. I climb up there. It's as cold as I've ever been. 10 years old. <laughs> and so Phil goes down to the next blind, and they're hunting with all the, the hunting party. And uh, I got so cold, and I had to take a leak, and I unzipped my coveralls and did my business. I was so cold, I couldn't zip up my coveralls. My hands wouldn't work. <laughs> so then I have two mallards come in. I mean, I have a gun yeah. and light in the decoys. And I was so cold, I could not lift the gun and pull the trigger. So when they came to get me, the two mallards came out of the decoys and Phil was like, what are you, no, they didn't shoot them. They was like, what are you doing? Why did you shoot them ducks? I said, I was too cold. I, I said, I was too cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, next time if I actually go duck hunting by myself, I'm going to say, leave Note me yourself. a heater. <laughs> Well, that's 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 good though, Jace. Because remember, who's a man was the theme of Dad's early life, and even though Dad became a Christian, who's a man hung around for a few years? Exactly. I look uh, back on that and thought, boy, that was that was you know a bold move, really. Because would I leave my ten year old? Probably not. But <laughs> I figured it out. It toughened me up. And hey, it made you the hunter you are today. So exactly, yeah, which is good. All right, let's take another break. The liver is affecting the heart. The liver so, makes you quiver. Well, you know what I thought? Look, what they should Maybe do. That's a new tag. Look, line. a liver and a heart walk into a bar. They were carried out. <laughs> <laughs> so to keep that from happening now, <laughs> tell us how to keep the liver healthy. Oh, man. So the American Heart Association, according to Jace's uh, bar joke, is he's right, because you're three and a half times more likely to have heart failure when you have liver problems. Yeah. So, Dad, you'll find this shocking. A hundred million Americans have fatty liver. It's almost a oh, third. It's, it is an, it's an epidemic. It's an epidemic. Uh, Zach and I have had our enzymes too high as well. So we want to help your liver. Liver Health Formula is our sponsor. Uh, they have an all-natural supplement. It contains 11 clinically proven botanicals, Jays, that help recharge and protect your liver. Because as you mentioned, alcohol, toxins, Tylenol, cigarettes, all those things are bad for your liver. So if you're looking to ignite your fat-burning metabolism, boost your energy, transform how you look and feel, Try Liver Health Formula. You're going to receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula that's going to reduce your sugar cravings as well. Try Liver Health Formula by going to getliverhelp.com slash unashamed. Get your free bonus gift, getliverhelp.com slash unashamed. All right, so welcome back. We're, uh, we're in Luke 19, or actually, we're in 21 today. Well... Sorry, I had the wrong page. Um, so it's Luke 21. Luke 21. Which doesn't uh, seem like an interesting big thing. Picture, big picture. Big picture. Uh, it is interesting that there's a movement, and there's always been the movement. It, it, it's, it comes forth when you read these old texts. So when you pick these texts up, there's a mighty throng of individuals who downgrade Jesus Christ by not recognizing that he established, as we know it, time. He established time. Correct. The one they're, they're saying, who is that saying? Jesus anointed by a, a sinful woman, all these headaches. Uh, Jesus, uh, he... Raises a widow's son. Yeah, where's the that? Wise at? and the foolish builders. Where's that at? A tree and its fruit. He's That's in Luke, Luke seven. six, Luke six. seven. Yeah, I just want you to give it. The faith of the centurion. Different men, different guys, different people, different problems, different uh, angles, and they themselves acknowledge that to to, to date in China, Russia or anywhere else on the globe, the human race, love him or hate him, 
But they say there's no such thing as Jesus. It's 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 it's, it's not real. The Bible is not real. But the time he established is the marker of all time. Mm -hmm. It's been two. We say, what year is it right now? Twenty twenty four. Twenty twenty four. You say, since what? By by what? Who 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 came up with the time? There he is, and the whole world jumps on board. Yep. Yet they say the one they jumped on board about doesn't exist. So twenty twenty four. If it's if they say yep, I said what year is it? They say twenty twenty four. I said, according to who? Well, that's Jesus time. Yeah, that's counting time by Jesus. I am coming. And when you read these verses, you say, yeah, they he doesn't exist. Well, you can read all about him. You count time by him. Yeah. If you count time by someone, I would at least investigate the one you're counting time by. Yeah. Or you won't know what the correct time is. Yeah. It's 2,024 years since Jesus was on the earth. Yeah. And then they the go back to his birth to document the time. Yeah. That's what if you don't acknowledge time. that time, you're never going to be amazing. Able to, it you, is. You're never going to be able to keep an appointment. Yeah. You, no. If you say, I'm just doing away with the, yeah. what do they call the calendar? And why didn't well, Russia, Russia they say, well, the Chinese, they say, well, you know, America counts time by this some supposedly they have some, a different some person back in the back. Mm -hmm. We don't believe in him, but we're going to count time by him like everybody else. Yep. I don't get it, Al. He's either marketable by his time. <laughs> He's the one who started time. Yeah. But you're right. Even the Chinese who have their own calendar. And yeah. celebrate a different New Year. They yeah. still have to function with the rest of the world by the twenty twenty four. I mean, they you can, don't believe in it, right? So what they tried to do now, they tried to change it and say, well, it has nothing to do with Christ. It was just the common error, yeah, and before the common error, yeah, yeah. Which you've yeah. said before. It just so happened that before the common error was all the years before Jesus got here. But here's another irony, Dad. John said in John one in the be in the beginning, which is the time marker, yeah was the Word. Yep. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So not only do we count time by His coming to the earth, we count time by His creation of the beginning of time and when He created our planet. Which the song says, does anybody really know what time it is? Yep, there you go, Chicago. Well, that this was day, pretty good. That was pretty good, then. For late 70s, it was better than 98% of country music singers. <laughs> Which we were talking about this before. You actually played us a little ditty on when you got here. Today. I thought the name of the song was I'm on the backside of 40, but it was actually 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about Zach's uh, health issues. And yeah, Zach. What when he, he can eat and can't. And you, you attribute yeah. it to him being 40, but and when you thought the song said 40, we listened to it, it actually says 30. Because that's a relationship yeah. song. Backside yeah, of 30. As soon as we came on before we started being on air. Zach went through about five ailments and Things you know, he, he was eat. sluggish and he, he's, you know, it was, sounded like the side effects for one of these pharmaceutical drugs. I mean, is it not, <laughs> is, it, is it actually 2024? The only it proof is. you have to, well, I to, think it's within to, 30 to years of that, that is you say, or three or four that's years. That's when within Jesus four. showed up. You say, yeah. give or take a few years. Yeah, it's, it's 2024 years since he was here. You at least need to check him out. I mean, because never, no one's going to count time by you, ever. <laughs> not me, not the Chinese. No. That's right. That's, not big enough for something. A good point. It's a good point. Just a thought. It's a, it's I a do, point. Al, you brought up the John 1, because I've been thinking about that. Isn't, isn't it ironic? John is almost like giving him this idea of a new beginning. It's like he goes back to Genesis, yeah, and he's like, in the beginning was the Word, the yeah. Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. That's Without crazy. him, nothing was made that has has been made. That's and the right attitude. When he comes to 14, though, to deal with what we're, we're studying in Luke, it says the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. In the Greek word, there's tabernacle. 
which is gets back to this temple mm-hmm. idea of God meeting humans, you know, heaven and earth interacting, which is what was happening in the book of Genesis. Genesis, and now here here comes John, just making a so such a profound statement, which yeah. is why we're counting time by him. This is a new beginning, and I'm telling you, when he came back from the dead, that's the reason time started to be to it became before and after this Jesus. I mean, but have you noted that then the process of reading about Jesus and his arriving on the scene and being the time marker, it always has, but some doubted. Even when he would do be raised from the dead, yeah, they they, they were all fired up, but some doubted. So, Jace, our friends at Helix Sleep, uh, which have provided us with some great mattresses, um, are trying to encourage our audience to have better sleep. What would you say about the importance of that? Here's the importance of this. I'm so sleep deprived in duck season because I'm staying up late and I'm getting up early before four o'clock every day. And so you could pretty much sleep anywhere. But the importance of a Helix mattress is that don't ever underestimate the concept of sleeping well. That's right. That's a good point. Hey, that's where I'm at. Because a few hours of really good rest is better than a longer time in the bed that you're not sleeping very well. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Uh, Helix Sleep, uh, that's what they provide, wonderful mattresses. Anytime I travel, it's usually when I get into wishing I was home in my Helix bed. Uh, what you do is when you go to their website, um, helixsleep.com slash unashamed, uh, you're going to take a Helix Sleep quiz, which we did, and that's going to tell, you know, some people like a little firmer mattress, some like it in the middle, some like it a little bit softer. And so they're going to match what you want and what you need uh, to you. Uh, they all come with a 10 or 15 year warranty, depending on the model, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, Helix also knows there's no better way to test out your new mattress than by sleeping on it in your own home. That's why they offer a 100-night trial uh, to be able to check it out and make sure that you love it. So we're asking you to check these guys out. Uh, That's what we sleep on. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our unashamed listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed. Use the code HELIXPARTNER20. Take that quiz, and you're going to wind up having the best night's sleep you can imagine. It's their best offer. It won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Helixsleep.com slash unashamed. Use the code HELIXPARTNER20. The doubters, Al, has really caught on here in the lately. But, but, <laughs> no, there's a lot of them. So, and the thing about this, though, Jase, you brought up this thing about Tabernacle, which is the idea of this sort of movable temporary tent that they set up for the worship in the desert, which until they got into what is now known as Israel, and then a temple was built. But look at how God has shown us this historical irony. Everything's another shadow. Because Jesus comes here, and while he was here about 33 years, yep. as the tabernacle, yep. as the Son of God living among us, then he dies, and he raises from the dead, and he becomes our what? Our temple. Yeah, exactly. I mean, then he's the permanent structure. So we don't need an earthly temple anymore. We That's why I brought up temple. that first Chronicles 17 last podcast, because David why, is why like— Why didn't they build it again? David's like, I'm living in a palace, and God's in a tent. What's wrong with this picture? And he's like, well, hang on. Yeah. Through your seed, there's one that's coming. That's right. But what I noticed, uh, what I think we need to do before we read our text in chapter 21, because I was reading ahead, and right after this, you know, feel, uh, feel, right after this, Jesus looking at this widow lady, give all she has, and then making this comparison to the people that were rich who were given, which is what we're going to read. Then you have this this same kind of dissertation about the destruction of the temple yep. in Jerusalem. Now it has symbolic language, and there's 
multiple beliefs on what all this means. Even even the caption in my Bible that is not was not part of the original manuscript, but it says signs of the end of the age, you know, 20, 21, 5, right above that it says By the way, it, but, Chase, <clears throat> they still go there with a piece of the temple that's left. Well, it's not even the piece of the temple. It's just a wall, yeah. one of the a retaining wall. walls. That's yeah. what I meant. Yeah. And look, and to put their notes in, their, their exactly. worship, yeah. their prayers. So I wanted to read the last two verses of chapter 21 because when you read them, you, it kind of puts it in perspective. It was each day Jesus was teaching at the temple, and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. So if you back up, all of what we've been reading since his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which is chapter 19 and verse 28, well, everything that happened, he was at the temple or in the temple court. He was doing this every day. So you look at 1945. Then he entered the temple. Remember, he he said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Then you have his authority challenged. You know, who do you think you are coming into the temple? And you remember that about John's baptism? Yep. And he didn't tell him where he was getting his authority. He then tells this parable about w- what we're supposed to be doing while during this transition period, you know, and then he then paying taxes to Caesar. Because you got to remember that temple, not only was it the religious center, it was like the nation's center Correct. for everything involved. Even when it was destroyed in AD 70, they, you know, it was not the Roman intent to destroy the temple. They, they were told not to. Yeah, they, they didn't want to destroy it. They were going to just take it over. That right. gold, but that fire gold started melting. Just because to your point, Jace, there was a lot of money flowing through, which is why Jesus went in and t- dumped it upside down. The temple tax was high. Yep. You know, and Rome wanted their piece of that too. So then this comes up with the Sadducees about the afterlife. Yep. And, and this is where it kind of starts the thread. But, but just keep in mind that this is all happening in and around the temple. So when you get to chapter 21 and verse 5, and just just to show you the point before we read our text in 21, 1 through 4, some of his disciples in verse 5 were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. So that that's what he's talking about here. It's not like we jumped up with some new idea and said, hey. Which is how you know, a lot of people approach this text. Yeah. If you just jerk it out of the context we're in and start applying it to all sorts of you know different belief systems, that's when you get into some pretty wild stuff. You basically have three chapters here, which should be called the temple section. That's what I call it. Holy court in the temple. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that, that's, that, that's good. Because if you go paragraph to paragraph, you, you tend to lose the big picture of right. it all. Exactly. You know, he's presenting this fact that he's going to be the temple. He is the temple, but he's going to prove that. Because what is a temple? It's where God dwells. Right. So later on, when this happens, and, and especially John's gospel gives a more detailed approach to how this is happening, because he promises to give the Holy Spirit. We did that last podcast, John 7, and then John 16, talking about how the Spirit would work. And then you get to John 20, and he's like, as I, as the Father sent me, I'm going to send you. Well, we know that we, we will then house or temple the Holy Spirit. Yep. You know, you get 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your body's a temple of, of God? And you have the First Peter 2. We rise together, living stones being built on Jesus as a cornerstone. We become the temple of God on earth. So you you see this all the way going back to John 1. And here, what I think has happened is when the Sadducees brought up this woman as an example to show how silly the afterlife was, they come up based on the law, 
What, what was that? What kind of law Lev was it? Left right marriage. Left right marriage. Because it's all about a widow. She's widowed seven times mm. or six times, seven husbands. So who's going to be her husband? Well, then all of a sudden, it's like this idea of a, of a widow, because from Jesus' perspective, he really cared about widows. Yep. He cared about the poor. He cared about uh, people that were afflicted with diseases. He, he cared about the demon-possessed. He cared about the rank sinners, the tax collectors, the outsiders, those with leprosy. So then it's like you have this point that, that we made about David, where he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Psalm 110. And then he brings up the Pharisees, and watch, watch what he says right before this. He says, they pursue the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. This is 46 of 20. They devour widows' houses. So he brings up widows again. Which So the Sadducees made up this illustration about this woman. But I think you kind of see through this that Jesus realized they're just making an illustration. They don't care about that woman. They're trying to trick him into making the afterlife and him believing in that. Stupid. Looks stupid. And that's what John 2 says when it says, Jesus said, destroy this temple and it'll come. I'll bring it back three days. So I think that's the lead in. It is. To chapter 21. To your point, Jace, the widow is the lowest person in on the in the socioeconomic situation here as an adult. I mean, children would be even considered less than a woman. Yeah, I looked it up. Ninety percent of widows in in America, I looked at it, has someone taken care of them. Or they live right. with a family member, a son, a daughter, okay. Yeah, you know, it, it's just a fact. Yeah, that, even to this day, with, with so many more opportunities, she was a woman, and then this culture puts her down because she, her only way to have any success in this culture was to be married to a man or have a son that was going to be able to provide for their family. So you're right. They looked at her as the lowest, but, which is really interesting, but still they would take advantage of them. Because he mentions that in this text, they devour their home. So yeah, I don't if, know what that means. I don't either. Except the, that I know that for money's sake, they didn't care about the widow; they cared more about the money. I, mean, I think it means they would go knock on their door and say, "Give me your money, and we'll take care of you." And they probably weren't taking care of them; they were taking the money. Yeah, and, and their homes, making it making it harder for them to operate. Yeah. So then he gets to chapter twenty-one. Because the reason we're being painful about going through all this, because there's a greater point he's making here, and I think it really comes out in a powerful way. In 21.1, he says, As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. And don't miss the point. He, he's at the temple again. And seeing this going on. He's observing this. And so my whole point for going through all that is if we are to be the temple of God, you got to realize that whatever the Pharisees are doing and whatever the Sadducees are doing, when it comes to people and money, we need to be doing the exact opposite in in our prayer life, in our helping others, in our task of helping the poor and widows and why we're given and how we're praying, all this should look different because he is ripping this. The kingdom does not look like what these people are representing. So then he says, I tell you the truth. He said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. Hmm. Now, mathematically, that doesn't make sense, which gets down to the heart of people. And, and it doesn't matter the amount. It, it's wherever your heart is. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So you got to remember, back in Luke 4, he brought this up again. This is in 24, and this is, I mean, right at the start of his ministry. But he says, you know, when he was in his hometown, he said, no prophet is accepted in his home hometown. I assure you, 
that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow of Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman. So when you go back, in, I think we read that when we were in Luke 4. Sure. But it's the story in, uh, I think it's First Kings 17. You probably remember the story better than I do. Is that the one of the widow and the... Did we not go over that when we, did. we were in Luke 4? We did. And she had a... She didn't have it. She basically was doing her last meal... Um, cause she had a son. Yeah. Elijah got fed by the ravens for, he, you know, the Lord was taking care of it. And then he sent him to this widow. This is first King seventeen seven, And you got to remember this woman was not a believer. She was a sinful woman. She was from, she was not an, uh, a Jew. Right. And, and he, that, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up is cause in Luke four, when he told that story, they got angry. And you say, why? Because yeah, she she was an outsider. In yeah. fact, in Luke 4, I should have read that. It said in verse 4, 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. They were going to kill him. So you say, why why was they so why were they so outraged? Which is the same thing's going to happen when you say that this wit is given more than all these people. Well, you know that made them. If anybody who heard that, the the wealthy, they're getting hot about this. Like, who do you think you are? And the reason is when you read the story in First Kings seventeen seven, she she didn't have any of the credentials that they accepted. One, she was an outsider. Two, she's a very sinful woman. She it you get the idea she didn't even believe in God. And then you have this story that people read and they're just confused about what's going on here because there's a miracle that happens. She doesn't have enough food to even feed herself. But Elijah's like, yeah, but the Lord told me that if you give me some, you won't run out, which happened. Well, then her son gets sick and is about to die. And then you see Elijah. He does die. And then Elijah lays on him and brings him back to life. Yeah. Well, it says he stretches out over him. And I I was like, I think it, you know, the only other time you read about being stretched out that way is when Jesus was stretched out on a cross. And I think this was a preview Mm. of what he was going to do in the gospel because he raises the son from the dead. Well, then the widow, who's an outsider, who's not a believer, who's a very sinful woman, she then believes. That's right. She's like, oh, well, what, why'd she believe? Because she saw Elijah, I believe, willing to give his life. That's right. And he saw, and she saw a resurrection happen. And, so, and to your point, Jace, the Luke 4 context, Jesus, the point Jesus is making there is, because he makes the same point about Naaman, who, remember, was an Assyrian who came to Israel for healing and received it, but only after he gave up his pride and his willingness to, to say, I'm all in. Well, it's the same with this woman. She's preparing her last meal for her and her son, then they're going to die. This is all she's got. And this guy comes in, Elijah, and says, I want the last thing you got, but if you give it to me, I'm going to give you more than you can ever imagine. And so, and both of them were foreigners. So Jesus is making the point in his hometown that foreigners are going to get this faster than you will, that you have to give to me the last of everything you are. And that's the whole point, even when we get to later in Luke 21. That's the concept. Well, that, that's, that's the idea. That's the, uh, that's the, uh, I think that's the big picture of Jesus's whole ministry is that this thing's opening up to everyone, the yeah. foreigners, all the nations, everyone's coming up that, that hill to worship that Isaiah two prophecy. It's, it's not what you think. It's always the weak, that Jesus goes after in the, the in this particular case, the picture he, he builds is this widow. But when he gets, the, it, it is connected to the temple because at the end of Isaiah, um, in Isaiah 66, this is what God says about the temple. He says, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne 
and earth is my footstool. In other words, he's he's just acknowledging his sovereignty and his power. And then he asked that question, the same question that Solomon asked that I mentioned in the last podcast. What is the house that you would build for me? You, know, you can just hear him say, that. what exactly are you going to build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All of these things my hand has made. And so all of these things came to be, declares the Lord. But the one, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And I love that because it's that's the picture of the gospel. It's and and what what I think the these Pharisees and Sadducees got wrong is they thought that that they had the power based on their intellect, based on their obedience to the law, based on their uh, their positions of power, based on their money, ba- whatever the thing was, based on their heritage. The, yeah, now their heritage and everything that Christ came to, to do is to say, like, like, no, just think about this logically. You you're going to build me a temple for me to dwell in. I just like, yeah. Think about what you're saying there. You're going to take the stuff that I made, and then you're going to build a place for me to live in. And that's where. And, and I got to have you to do that. It's the yeah. same thing Paul said. The Lord your God doesn't dwell in temples by right. uh, built by man's hands, as if he needed anything. So, well, before we go to overtime, I just wanted to say the reason I read the Luke four is when he said that about the widow. He had just said in Luke four eighteen through twenty one. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, because it was a quote from Isaiah. He was saying, this is what the kingdom is going to look like. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing the exact opposite. And even today, when we have the Holy Spirit... We should be doing this kind of business in our world as representatives of of Jesus. Yeah, that's good. And we'll explore that a little bit more in our overtime segment. Uh, if you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed. We'll see you there. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.